Welcome everyone. I'm Diane with EdWeb, and it's my honor to introduce our presentation today with the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. I'm here with Kathy Metcalf, Executive Director of Education for the Society, and our honored guest, Medal of Honor recipient, Captain Florent Groberg, who received the medal for his service in the U.S. Army in Afghanistan. Thanks everyone for attending, and Kathy, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Diane. Good morning, Flo. I'm going to give everybody a little bit of background on us. Thank you all for signing on and attending with us today. I'm Kathy Metcalf from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. The society is actually made up exclusively of Medal of Honor recipients. I just have the privilege of working for them to oversee this education program. And I would like to, as we get started here, thank the Society and the Medal of Honor Foundation and the supporters who make this program possible to come to all of your all of the educators free of charge. So the character development program is what uh, Flo and I are here a little bit to talk about today, but mainly for him to share his uh, thoughts with you about the Medal of Honor and about uh, character. So um, Flo, thank you for joining me. Our audience is usually teachers in the classroom, but this, of course, given the pandemic, is an unusual circumstance for us. I don't think we have any teachers actually in classrooms, but I'm hoping that perhaps um, there are students who with an accompanying adult have signed on to join us today. At the end of the webinar, this program will be archived so that when teachers do get back into a classroom or remotely, they can send the link to the classroom so that students can see this, this program. So our goal is to address as many teacher and student questions as we can today. and we have a whole lot of people who sent in questions ahead of time, so we'll be going with those. But to start with, Flo, let's just do a little get acquainted for everybody. Um, I've known you for a few years now, and I've read the book, so I'm at, a, a, at an advantage. And I would hope that lots of our viewers have also watched your video that's available on Vimeo at the character uh, at the Medal of Honor website. Um, to get started, you were not a Native American. Would you tell us a little about your journey to becoming an American? Yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you, Kathy. Thank you to the society. Thank you to the foundation. Thank you for everyone that's uh, you know, part of this event today, virtual event. Um, obviously, we all wish we could be there in person, but this is a really nice way for all of us to uh, still connect. Um, I'll tell you what. It's been a heck of a journey for my life. And you're right. I wasn't born in the United States of America. I was born in France. And I didn't come to this country until I was about 12 years old. Um, I'm lucky uh, my entire life. I've been blessed and lucky. And I'm, I'm blessed that uh, a, a guy named Larry Groberg met my mother uh, back in France. And he decided to you know, adopt me and marry her and, and bring us to the United States. But I never met my biological father. You know, and this is not a sad story. It's actually a, you know, a blessing because I am here today with these type, with these type of opportunities in front of me. So it's just the way life was, you know, presented to me and my family. But I came here. I lived in just outside of Chicago in Palatine, Illinois, and uh, from there we moved to Bethesda, Maryland. But cool thing is, uh, I guess it's a cool thing now. Looking back, it was a little bit frustrating at times. I didn't speak English till until um, about you know thirteen years old. So when I came to the U.S., I was at a French international school, and then I left and went to middle school, Tilden Middle School in Bethesda, Maryland, and I was in Esau, um, and English is a second language. Obviously, everyone here knows about that. But uh, the most fascinating thing that I've been trying to rehash and just think about and, and trying to figure out how I did it was the fact that I was in English as, as a second language, Esau, one and two, for my English courses, but for math, science, even PE, everything else, I was with the regular kids. And to this day, I still don't understand how I made it through. So, but it worked out because in, in a very, very, very short period, I was able to really grasp the language and learn. Uh, I was in regular English by uh, freshman year of high school, and I was in honors English by uh, junior year of high school. So, you know, that whole process uh, came quick to me. I've been blessed in my family. We, we are lucky with languages. My, my dad speaks nine. My mom speaks six. Wow. You know, I speak, I used to speak three fluently. Now I speak two and a quarter. Um, but uh, so we, we, we were lucky. But that's how it was uh, uh, 
just a, a great opportunity and I think that my mom going on this on this date with her sister, a, a double date, a blind date, turned out really well for all of us. Well, it sure sounds like it. And I know both in, in person and in your video and in, in your book, you have have credited your, your dad repeatedly with having taught you that Grobergs don't quit. And yeah. um, some of our, a couple of different schools sent in questions about your experiences in your childhood that helped to develop your character and specifically who in your life helped instill uh, your character. Do you want to speak to that a bit? You know, every one of us, I, that's just my personal belief, has someone or something has influenced them at, throughout their lives in different periods of their lives. And, you know, when I was born, Obviously, without a father, the father figure that I had was was my uncle, um, Uncle Abdu, and a man more than anything else in the world. And he was just, you know, he was my Abdu. I used to call him my Abdu, uh, and he was my my rock, my world. I, I just I always followed him around every time I saw him in his presence all the time. Obviously, when my dad came in the picture, um, he became you know, that figure. But some of the things that have happened throughout my life have had different specific periods of time that has really influenced me. And, you know, the first person to really influence me to an extent that it changed the foundation, uh, my f personal foundation, and it really started paving the way of my life uh, path was my uncle when he was killed in 1996. So I'm telling you this now because it's very important, right? Usually very negative situations tend to impact you a little bit longer, a little bit more than the really positive situations. We are, as human beings, tend to kind of move on from positive situations really quick. You know, we, we remember it's good and then we just kind of move on. But we really linger and, and, and talk about and remember the, 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 the situations that impacted us. And so I didn't understand this now. And I'll tell you this right now, you know, as we have a conversation you'll see where this really falls through. But I am a firm believer in finding it a positive in a negative situation. And so that allows me to really learn and grow and become a better person because of it. When I was 12 years old and I found out that my uncle had been killed in Algeria uh, by a terrorist organization called a GIA, that shook my foundation. That shook everything about me. Um, I couldn't understand how such a beautiful human being could be, you know, murdered in essence and, uh, and what they did to him. Uh, so quick background, he was an imam, right? So half my family is Lutheran, the other half is Muslim. Um, and he was Muslim. He was an imam. He was 22 years old. His entire life was about, you know, preaching the faith of, uh, of the Quran, people around him, his family, people he loved. And so when this terrorist, just like ISIS, just like man, and perverted his he took arms. Uh, in Algeria, he became a commando, he became special forces, came actually to the United States, was able to train with some of some of our spec ops folks, went back and fought them. And on a ceasefire uh, in, on February 6, 1996, uh, his unit was ambushed, he was shot, he was beheaded, he was dismembered, he was put in a box, and he sent to my grandfather. I say this, uh, the reason why they sent to my grandfather is my grandfather was a, um, a, is, is still alive, is pretty well known in Algeria. He was a prisoner of war in uh, the front, front French Indochine, so the French Vietnam, and then he was part of the group that rose against the French for the Algerians' independence in the uh, in late 50s. And so that was a message sent to my family saying, we don't care who you are, we don't care what your history is, You're, um, if you don't follow us, we will kill every one of you. And so that changed me. Uh, that was the first really situation where my entire life completely changed. I, I, for, first time I understood and saw, in essence, evil, uh, but I couldn't comprehend it. And so I had all these thoughts uh, in my head and I was just super angry. And at, at that path, at, at that moment, I knew that I wanted to join the military and I wanted to go find, fix and, and destroy these people. So I had a lot of hate and anger. Mm -hmm. and you fast forward a few years and 9-11 happens. And I was just then naturalized as a, a U.S. citizen, probably five mm -hmm. months prior in February. And, wow. and so here I am, a, a, a new American. Uh, freshman in college, and the same type of people, the same type of group comes in and just creates this incredibly horrific, you know, act of terror on our, on our soil. And I knew at that point, there was no way of escaping it. This was, you know, they, I felt, per, if, to me, it was actually very, very personal uh, in a sense that I felt like they were following me. Um, and so here I was, 
I had to make a decision and I was a freshman in college and I wanted to drop out of school. And I'm going to, I'm saying, I'm, I'm giving you this story because of what Kathy brought up about the, the, the Roberg Creed. <laughs> when you start something, you finish it. So of course I called my father and my father has been, you know, had been my rock uh, throughout, you know, since I met him. And he's a man of very few words, but they're very direct. They're very insightful and they hit home whether or not I like it. And so when I told him my, my, my initial thought of dropping out of school to join the army, you know, he listened. And then he asked me one specific question. His question was, when I gave you my name, what is the one thing I asked of you? Of course, I couldn't remember, but you know, he reminded me. And he reminded me, he says, when a Groberg starts something, he or she finishes it. Because if you just start something and find a reason to quit, they will find a reason to quit everything else that they start in life, whether it's work, school, a relationship, whatever you want to call it. And so you need to make a tough decision, and I can't make it for you. And I remember going to bed that night very angry at my father because, you know, who's a guy that served his country? He is, um, you know, as Republican as you can possibly imagine, right? I mean, if a cat was running for the Republican Party, he'd vote for a cat over a Democrat. So, you know, you can imagine where he comes from. Well, my mom's the complete opposite. Maybe that's why I'm so grounded. <laughs> yeah, balance, <laughs> but, balance. It's good to know that side. But, um, you know, when it comes down to making the real tough decisions, he is the most insightful person I've ever met in my life. And he, he really grounded me on that day. I was angry at him. I woke up and I said, okay, I'll finish. I'll graduate. And then once I graduate, I'll join the, the military. And he said, I'll be there with you every step of the way. And so that's how this whole situation happened. And that's how this whole uh, Groberg, uh, you know, we fin- when we start something, we finish it happened. Very good. Well, that actually leads right into another question that was sent in by a couple of different schools. And that is, were there things in in high school and or college that um, influenced you and helped prepare you both for ranger school, if anything could prepare you for ranger school, and later for Afghanistan? Well, I think, you know, high school was a, a such a development part of my life you really I mean I came in high school it's five one and and 95 pounds right wow. and so so you know, and I was a really good soccer player and uh, I wanted to play on the varsity team and you know I got put in the locker as an hazing thing I had to climb a tree <laughs> with my teammates and sing songs to the girls soccer team right and you know they and probably the most the big the, the one memory that I remember from high school was I couldn't you know I was in regular English, but I still had an accent. And there, were, to this day, there are certain words that are difficult for me to read and or to pronounce, right, because of the French. And so we were reading Romeo and Juliet, and all the kids were like, make Flo Romeo, make Flo Romeo, make Flo Romeo. And of course, they made me Romeo, the teacher. And then the girl that I had a crush on and all my friends knew, they made her Juliet. Uh-oh. And... Um, it was very difficult for me to read that book, and I felt incredibly embarrassed, and I felt really sad, and I was just, you know, and angry at myself because I just couldn't read these words. But and everybody was laughing. You know, you're fre- you're a freshman, ninth grade, and everybody was laughing, and so a girl thought it was cute, but you know, I didn't like it. I remember thinking like, I don't like this feeling. You know, I don't hate people laughing at me. I'm not a comedian, and so. I figured, well, there's only one way. I need to really get better at reading. And it's not like I didn't understand the words. I completely understood the words. I just couldn't pronounce them the right way, like everybody else, because that was not my native language. And so I worked my butt off, you know, trying to, you know, I had my dad just kind of sit with me and, and just, I'd read and he just had to correct me. And I hated it too, right? My mom too. And so, you know, I wanted to, to, to improve. And it's such a difficult, th- it doesn't happen overnight. It's not possible. Yeah. You know, reading is right. just, you know, and reading words and pronouncing words and things like that doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. But it, it made, it made a, a, a massive influence in, in my early years in high school. And it challenged me in, a, in a, such a very different way because it wasn't sports, right? Everything else was always about sports. I'm an athlete. That's an athlete my entire life. Judo, soccer, track, right? And so that played a massive role in my development and my thinking process and how my never quit mentality, but my, my, by how I challenge myself internally and how when no one's watching me, the way I think and the way 
I feel about myself and how I want to make sure that I am just better and I try to do, you know, than, than the day prior. And so that was a mindset that I had in high school. In college, it was track and field. In college, it was track and field because I, um, you know, we didn't have a big, big scholarship pool for track, you know, football and, and, right. and basketball and the big sports gave all the money. So I still worked 30 hours a week and I went to college. I went to school every day. You know, I ran track. I had two practices a day for a Division One team. I was team captain. And I also worked, you know, 25 to 30 hours a week. And so, but then on Sundays, I had my 20 mile run when, by myself or with another teammate. So wow. there was a lot, of, this thing called integrity and doing the right thing when no one's watching. And that was really without thinking about it. It's not like I woke up in the morning and I thought, man, I need to do the right thing because no one's watching. That's going to help me. I just thought it was the right thing to do for me to get better and to make it through, pay my bills and then to be, become a better athlete and then, you know, and be a good student. And that process was, you know, just in, instilled in me in college and uh, since my freshman year when I was completely on my own and you started driving through and that, that mindset working at the police auxiliary, um, uh, doing the night shift from 9, 9, 8, 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. at the gates, you know, checking ID cards that people that come in the gate to get up, you know, to go to practice at 6 a.m. Uh, and then to go to class at 8 a.m. That was tough. But I was lucky because I was young, right? And I was, I didn't need eight hours of sleep. Now, unfortunately, that backfired for me in, re in regards to my progress as a track athlete because I was a four, I think I'd end up being a 404 miler, which is, um, wow. but if I would have had the, the training and I've had the, the nutrition and the sleep and all that stuff, I think I could have broken four in a mile. But guess what? I don't care today. Why? Because I'm very content with every single experience I had in my life. That's just the way my life was meant to be. Um, but I also learned something that track and field could, couldn't teach me at the time. And that is called, you know, internal, internal sacrifice. And no one told me I had to do that job. I just, that was the highest paying job and it paid the bills. And it made sense. And I enjoyed it. And so I did it. And, you know, I really put this mindset that helped me go through the Army and really Ranger School. And by Ranger School, it means this. I challenge myself every day in an uncomfortable state to be better. So that's my high school mindset right there, right? Where I'm just, I will need to work harder than everybody else to make sure that I understand the concept. I understand my process. I understand my mission. And I understand, you know, the, the day's activities and what I need to be, do as an individual to help support the team. And then the other piece was I had to have integrity. Well, no one's watching at night, right? That I, when I was on patrol and I had to cover a specific sector that I didn't go to sleep when I knew no one was there and I could have taken a good 15 minutes, you know, of sleep. But no, that's not the process. I'm not in a leadership role. I'm supposed to support the leader. And the leader told me to cover this sector and run security. And I knew for a fact that I could just take a couple minutes of, of just, you know, close my eyes, let it go, you know, energize myself. But I didn't do that. Why? Because that wasn't my role. That wasn't my responsibility was to do my job. And that helped me get through Ranger School. I think that also earned me kudos with my peers. And I was one of the lucky guys, you know, 333 of us started and 69 of us graduated. Well, I read the book, and as many times as I've talked to you, we've never talked about Ranger School, but I did just read the book, and having read your experience in Ranger School, I think it was a lot more than luck. I think that grit and that perseverance were definitely there, and, and definitely your dad's words, and also you had some support from some other people. Gallardo. Yeah, I, it's, absolutely. Well, I, you know, the, so I'll give you the book. I didn't want to write a book, and... You know, Tom Saleo, who's an outstanding individual, wrote some really great books, came to me and said, hey, let's write a book about your, about your life and, and your journey. And I thought to myself, I'm, I don't know how old I was then, you know, 30, I'm, I'm going to be 37 next week. Book came out two years ago. All right, let's say 34. And I'm like, I'm 34 years old. What the heck do I bring to the table to talk about my life? Like, hey, come on, let's go. Let's, let's, you know, let's talk about this when I'm, you know, 80. And he said, no, you have some stories that you could really share. And then at the end, we decided the only reason I'll write this book is if I get to talk about the people that influenced my life. And more specifically, I want to talk about Command Sergeant Major Griffin, Major Gray, Major Kennedy, and Reggie Abdel Fattah, who were killed on August 8, 2012. And he said, okay. 
And I said, then we need permission from their families to even write this book. So we need to talk to every single one of them and make sure that they're okay and comfortable with us writing about their loved ones. If they say no, next. And then he said, okay. And we got all those thumbs up. And then I said, you need to go out there and talk to the people that actually influenced my life and that were part of my unit. So, because I can tell a story, but I only remember a specific way. I want my soldiers who are part of it also have a voice in it because I wanted them to inject, um, you know, their, the, the way they visualize it or remember it. Uh, and if it's quite different in my, my way of remembering, then that's, that's a, you know, ding, ding, uh, key part for us to see where I'm missing something and, and bring more people in the process. But really, the whole point of the book was to talk about people that influenced me throughout my life. And if you read every chapter, it's always a struggle because life is a struggle. That's just the way life is, you know. And that's why we should enjoy the good moments. We should really cherish the good moments because we work so hard for them. But every single chapter talks about in specific individuals that helped me get through. And that's one first chapter was my uncle and Gallardo. And Gallardo Mm -hmm. was this guy who was. A butt, and and he, but he was incredibly well respected and tough, and he took me under his wing, and he challenged me in ways that uh, really made sense at the time. He didn't baby me around; um, he just kind of challenged my my inner core, and um, he knew how to get to me, and it, it got me through Ranger School because of him um, and and other factors and the team that I was surrounded with. Mm-hmm. Well, you did a you and and uh, Tom did a great job because I felt like I knew all these people by the end. I have met Gallardo, I, so I've had the privilege of yeah. getting to know him with all the connections between you and Sal. That's that's all pretty cool. I you know I think that that the way you tell your story and the way you're talking about it today is is a, a strong reflection on the Medal of Honor itself, which we'll get to in a few minutes. I want to talk about Afghanistan a little and then go to the Medal of Honor, but I think it's so important that while the Medal of Honor ends up oftentimes defining many of you, or at least in the eyes of the public, it's only a few seconds or a few days in each of your lives. And so it really isn't who you are by itself. And I love that you're telling us all this background to put that in perspective. And I I see what you mean at 34, you know, gosh, that's only, you're only a tiny way into your life. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, we kind so of hope so. It's um, so interesting that you, you say that, though, um, about that the fact that, you know, the medal is only a few seconds of your life or a couple hours. You know, for some some of these guys in Vietnam, it was a couple of days <laughs> in right, World War II or right. Korea. Um, but, you know, one thing that I'm a firm believer in, and everything that I say, I speak based upon my own personal opinions, right? I am, I, I cannot, you know, tell you how other recipients feel or the way if that's the way that they believe you know or understand or cherish whatever you want to call it, the medal but i'm pretty sure that if you did a, a comparison we'd be all very close and one we never feel like it belongs to us and that we deserve it that's hands down without a doubt two it's more than likely been the worst day of our lives um and that we have to talk about and relive or or you know just kind of replay in our heads or to other folks um, and three, there's a massive responsibility behind it to make sure that we earn it and that we are the right couriers. That's how I feel. I feel like the medal is not about me. No way. To me, the medal is, is not about an individual. It's impossible. I do not represent the medal. And there's no way. It's way bigger than me. This is about you know, our country. This is about the sacrifice that men and women are willing to make in our country. And every single one of us has received a medal on that specific day. It's not like we did all the work or this is all about us. There's a whole team that was behind it, right? And we were just chosen um, to represent that specific day, that specific action, or those people who didn't come home or many of the recipients actually didn't make it. But what we were and what we are will always be, and what I want to remember us to be remembered as is we were good teammates. We were part of the mission and we were part of a team and we played a specific role. And we were, you know, some of us got, I'm here today, but I don't know how. But the reality is, for me, I, I look at the medal and it belongs to the Griffin. It belongs to the, it belongs to the Kennedys. It belongs to the Abdel Fattahs uh, because they died on that day. And their families have to live with the consequences of those actions every single day. And so my purpose with this medal that I have here is to make sure that I, 
earn the right to still be on this earth. That I live my life in a way that their families are honored. That I still that I'm I'm on this that I represent them, but they are honored that the fact that I am here doing the right thing. And I hope that one day when I get to meet my friends again, you know, they look at me and say, you know what, you you did you did well, you did good, and uh, we appreciate the hard work that you put in uh, for all of us, taking care of our families, representing us, you know, our memories. But really, it's it's I, they're all going to say the same thing. It's really about their families, and so. That's just the way I see the medal. To me, it's an opportunity to represent our nation in a different capacity uh, with honor and respect, with integrity. And it's about an opportunity for me to make sure that I am also reminded every single day that I am, am blessed to still be here, to still spend time with my families. And, and, you know, and, but I have a responsibility to make sure that I never forget, ever forget the sacrifice that others have made for me to be here. And I think that's what this medal represents. It represents that our nation. It represents the men and women who put on the uniform every single day, um, who are willing to travel thousands of miles away in a foreign land for many months and years at a time and not see or talk to their families and, and you know, put their lives on the line day in, day out, night in, night out. When no one's watching, no one's paying them millions of dollars. Yeah, they do it because they have love of country, but really love for each other. And then finally, it represents the families. They have to you know, follow that, that same type of journey in a very different fashion, in a fashion that I believe is a lot harder because they don't have control of it. And they just live you know, every day hoping that everything goes well. And, if, and when it doesn't, then you know, they're the ones that we look up to and we need to recognize and appreciate and uh, listen to as well. Uh, th that was a, a beautiful description, Flo, of, of what this medal is all about. Uh, I want to mention, just in case some of our uh, viewers today are not aware of it, uh, I think that you hit the nail on the head when you were talking about what it means and that you don't do it alone. And that is reflected in the fact that the Medal of Honor is the only of the medals that is instigated and must be supported by eyewitnesses from the people who were there with you. So that, yeah. that does make a huge difference in what it's all about. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, Afghanistan because we got some interesting questions. I don't want to go necessarily into the details unless you want to of the specific action uh, because our viewers can see that, can hear about it on your video and read about it in your book. But for instance, we have a couple of questions from some younger students who want to know things like, what was your first night like in Afghanistan and what did you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in Afghanistan? Oh, that's great questions. My first night light in Afghanistan. I, I think I was in, in awe and sort of a, I wouldn't, I, I, in my head it's like kid in a candy store, but that's absolutely not what it was like. I think it was just more like of a reality check, like, whoa, I, I was a deer in headlight. Here we go. I was a deer in the headlight. Everywhere I went, I just, you know, I couldn't believe it that I've, I've been dreaming about this moment um, for a long time. And I trained for, you know, a long time. And I went to one of the toughest schools and, you know, made it through it. And here I am. And this is, I'm, I am now in a world where other people have the same type of passion as I do and, and with the same mission. And here they are just operating like, you know, normal. This is their life. And I, I, I just remember going to bed that night in my bunk uh, with hundreds of other soldiers around at the time because I was still wasn't with my unit thinking in Bagram thinking this is it like this is a re this is I'm in the game now let's go and I started you know really processing things a little bit differently but I uh for breakfast was always the same thing uh we I would so depend depend it's all depends on where you are when I was in Bagram, I would go out there and eat eggs, you know, and, and toast. Man, I am a toast phenom, right? So, like, I got my, my butter, my jelly, my coffee, and um, I do that. And then I do some eggs, scrambled eggs usually, uh, bacon, all that good stuff. That's what I used to eat because I was in great shape, you know. And especially over there when it's hot stuff, you burn calories like crazy. So I could eat whatever I wanted to. Uh, lunch, I don't even know. I usually ate whatever was there, right? So it's, you could, it was a rotation. Uh, the chow hall, it could be uh, pasta, it could be steak, same thing, uh, not steak, but um, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> we did have steak, like on very rare occasion. 
But when I got to my base, it all depended on, on the clip. And so the clip was the supply uh, um, unit that we had that would come in and bring food. So sometimes, you know, at night we'd have spaghetti and all that good stuff. But sometimes if the clip got into a firefight or things were a little bit delayed, you ate MREs, meals ready to eat. Um, and so it all depended on, 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 on the situation. But I will never forget that two things. One, my first one in Afghanistan, my company commander, who is a great friend now, uh, Captain Conlin, and now he's a tank colonel Conlin, hated spaghetti. And I just couldn't understand how a human being could hate spaghetti. It's, it's just, it's not, that's <laughs> right? not possible. So I made a deal. And my best friend, my best friend from high school, I mean, co- high school we met, but in college, my best friend in the world of college, we ended up in a randomly, completely different path in the army, but at the exact same time, exact same place in Afghanistan, there were two platoon oh. leaders. So, he, so Gavin Collin had to deal with both of us. And I remember we made a deal with the cooks and we said, look, for the next, like, Three days for dinner, let's do spaghetti. And I'm, I remember, I'll never forget how Captain Conley was so pissed on the second <laughs> night. He's like, what? Spaghetti? Spaghetti again? And we're like, listen, boss, hey, you know, the clip got hit. And unfortunately, this is all we have for next week. And he was just like that. So he ate MREs. Um, and he, because he couldn't, he just couldn't stand uh, <laughs> spaghetti. But to us, that was, that was a highlight. That was the big, best highlight of our, of our, of our day. <laughs> But the second thing is the cooks lied to us and they had a secret stash of of ice cream in one of the in a, yeah ice cream. and we found out about it and we broke the lock and ate the ice cream like we're just I mean this is we're like four year olds right like you know over there oh, ice cream they cut the locks <laughs> ate all this great and they were so pissed at us that they could they wouldn't cook for us for like three days. So I bet you didn't eat spaghetti for a week. <laughs> no, no, but I I could have done that. I'd eat spaghetti every day. <laughs> That's great. That is a great answer. Um, another young person sent in the question about what was the best part of your mission? Now, we I know that you did a lot of missions while you're there. So maybe what what are some of your uh, greatest feelings of success when you were in Afghanistan? I think it's, you know, you, you read stories and I don't pay attention to the media as much anymore. Um, really, I stopped paying attention as much after my first tour because I, I read and saw a lot of news stories about what we were doing in Afghanistan and the waste and all that stuff. And, and it was very different than my experience. That was in Eastern Afghanistan. I was in the mountains. Uh, they don't, these people don't have internet. They don't have, they have those Nokia cell phones that they randomly charge. I don't know how. And I got to spend a lot of times. I owned seven villages. And when I say own, I didn't own them. Right. I mean, that was part right. of my mission. U S side. I owned that area of operation, but I didn't own anything. That, that's their own villages. But I was in, I, I spent a lot of times with elders. I spent a lot of time with the Afghanis out there. And, um, I, you know, we built schools. We helped them with retaining walls. I gave them, you know, I had them come in and rebuild the gate uh, our, of our base. And, you know, I, I, I used to, you know, take bids from different contractors, local Afghan contractors. And, you know, we give them work. Um, we did, uh, you know, health and welfare checks. We brought vets to go out there to take care of their cattle and their and and uh, their animals. Uh, and I think one of the greatest moments in in my life was when I was sitting down in um, one of the villages, and one of the elders, you know, called me Governor Groberg, and he said that uh, you need to come back and spend time with us. You know, when the war is over, like be our friend, like come back and visit. You know, you're a good man and and all that stuff. And and the fact that we connected and our soldiers connected with a lot of these people and they wanted all they want is, you know, to live their lives. They didn't want us to be honest there. They didn't want Taliban. And they were very grateful that we were, we came here and we tried to help. Mm -hmm. Um, And I will never forget those conversations, those moments and the, the mission and the army and the military and the government screwed it up by calling it hearts and minds. Because that made, that became a you know sort of a, a negative uh, a slogan for us, right? Because we're out there to fight, but then you got cars and mines. But the reality was, we actually did. I my some of my best days were spending time with those local villagers and really looking them in the eyes and having a conversation and knowing that they respect you and you respect them. Um, sometimes we had tough conversations too. And I told them how I felt because if things weren't going right, 
but it was a mutual respect in the fact that you know and you see that you're helping someone and you're helping and you're changing someone's life and you hope it's for the good. That's great to hear from you who were there and saw it on the ground because it, there's not always the balance that is reported. So it's good to hear that. Thank you. But you know what? Um, there were great there were great reporters out there too. And oh yeah. you probably John Cantley. Um, you probably have seen him, and so you know, do a re- John Cantley was a a reporter that was embedded with us. Unfortunately, he um, he was captured by ISIS. Oh. Um, and he has been, he was forced to do some of our documentaries for a long time. And we, we don't know if he's, he hasn't been officially declared, you know, ca- killed or, or not. Um, but he was, uh, he was a great reporter because he came in and he, he was embedded with us. And he just wanted to tell our the truth on the ground and the story on the ground. And he didn't fluff it off. I, I read his stories. It was just like the way it was. And I love that. Right. And so that's to me, I had a lot of respect for that. He was a little crazy, and obviously, look what happened to him. He wanted to put himself in some really difficult situations, and that didn't turn out too well for him. But I respect the heck out of that. Oh, absolutely, and I, you know, I think that uh, you really have a have to have call it crazy, if you will, but a, a really intense sense of commitment to be willing to take the kinds of risks that somebody not armed would put themselves in there, and you know, risk yep. enough if you are armed. Um, let's. I would. Uh, I, we're going to have to have you come back for a second webinar because we're going to run out of time. I still have three pages of questions for us to go here. But um, let's take a look at a cu- couple of questions about the Medal of Honor. Um, I know a lot of the answers because I read the book. But would you share with the audience what went through your mind when you actually got the call that you were going to receive the Medal of Honor? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be shorter in my answer so we can hit more. But... <laughs> When I got the call, it was obviously from, you know, there's a whole whole story before that. But um, when I got the call on September 21st, 2015, I was getting a call from, you know, I, it wasn't really the medal. I thought I was, I was, I thought I was going to be the distinguished service cross I was with the military for some reason, right? Because you never know in these days. And you're like, what, did we do yeah. something wrong at some point? And so, because no one... All I, I, the call the week prior was like, can you be, this is a, from the Pentagon, be ready for a call at 1400 or 1430 from senior high ranking official. And so at first you're like, oh my God, what did we do? And then you start thinking about it. And I had heard that I had been put in for a distinguished service cross. And then I seen Cal Carpenter, I knew Cal, um, mm-hmm. it, you know, he had, when he was warned, I think he had said that, you know, someone from the White House was going to call him. So I was like, oh, I didn't think metal. I thought distinguished service cross. So when I picked up the phone and the lady was like, "Do you mind holding for the president of the United States?" You're, you're, you're. Uh, that was a shocking moment. And so here on my cell phone, and I got the White House, and it's Obama comes on. And so I thank God I had the opportunity to meet him a few times. Uh, he came in my hospital room in September uh, 11th of 2012, and then I got to meet him again. He invited me to the White House a, a time a couple of years later. So I felt like I had a, a small relationship with him. So it wasn't that shocking, but it was freaking shocking. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, I remember she said, would you mind waiting for the, pre- I had this on video. Um, you mind waiting for the president? Uh, you mind holding for the president of the United States? I was like, yes, 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 sure. Okay. Then what? <laughs> and um, he came on and I think my heart was started racing really fast, but he's got just a way of calming you down and the way he speaks uh, is just like, like a friend or a father figure, whatever you want to call it. Um, it was an unbelievable, uh, surreal moment uh, that lasted a couple of minutes. And then I hung up the phone and I immediately broke his one order that he gave me. At the end of the phone call, he said, Flo, don't tell anyone anything about this call until the White House announces it. That's, I was like, I'm giving you an order. That's it. And I hung up the phone. Of course, my, my girlfriend, now wife, Carson, was, you know, heard the whole thing. He, and that's okay. But I told her, I said, if I don't tell my mother about this phone call, I'm not going to be at the White House on November 12th because she's going to kill me. So I had to call her and I called her and I told her and I said, and I had a white lie. I added a white lie in it. And I said, Mom, the president specifically told me to tell you that if you tell anyone, specifically your good friend called Facebook, you're not invited to the White House. And so she's like, you said that about me? I was like, yes. Yeah, 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 sure. I'm like, yes, I'm 100% sure. And so uh, she held it in. First time she ever kept a secret. 
<laughs> so, it worked out. <laughs> and you did the right thing by calling your mom too. <laughs> um, I, still need, I, I still need to tell um, you know President Obama that I, I disobeyed him. I figured that, that's good for another couple of years. Yeah, well, it's in the book now, so he might have heard. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yes, and uh, and we just said it on uh, you know a national webinar here. Um, a couple of other students have asked. Um, well, first of all. Um, what do you remember about the most about the Medal of Honor ceremony? I uh, first of all, thank you for all the messages. I see them like come through on the chat, so yeah. I just want to say I'm reading them. I really appreciate all the nice comments. Uh, you guys are awesome. Second, uh, what I remember most is how uh, uh, ashamed and I felt on on that stage. Probably was the uh, the the toughest moment, one of you know toughest personal moments I've ever felt. Because you're here on on a stage, you're sweating. You have the president of the United States to your left. You have all these high-ranking officials, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Army, all these military leaders. But what's most important, you have the Gold Star families in front of you, and uh, all these cameras in the back, and all these people are there for you, and they're here to celebrate you and highlight you, congratulate you for the worst day of your life. When I personally, still to this day, feel like I failed, and so I felt ashamed. And I remember sitting there and just kind of looking at, at everyone thinking, I feel like I'm a farce, you know, and I felt like this is totally not, you know, something that I, I deserve. And um, I wish that, uh, you know, I could trade places with my friends who didn't come home or trade this, all, all this for them to still be on this earth. So that was the moment. That's how I felt on that day. But the Gold Star families and my family and my teammates, most importantly as well. They were there. Every single individual that was part of that patrol was there on my team. Uh, it got me out of this without realizing it because I started thinking about it. This is not about me. Yeah, I am right now on the center stage, but this is not about me. And this is that challenge where I, I promise, promise myself that I will never, ever, ever be associated with this medal, wear that medal, and not talk about everybody else. But specifically not talk about the men uh, who didn't come home. And I will sit her names every time my name has ever associated with a medal. It's about them, and I will make sure somehow, some way to you know highlight them or talk about them, or you know, you know, I need to, I need their memories to live on. And so, I was thinking about all that at that moment, <laughs> and that yeah. was, uh, was, it was difficult. But that that speaks to what you mentioned earlier about the weight and the responsibility that goes with that medal. It's and and as you mentioned, almost every Medal of Honor recipient that I've ever heard speak, and I've listened to a lot of them, they all mention the weight of that medal because of what it represents. Um, on the other side of wearing the medal, though, you've obviously had some opportunities, not the least of which is hanging out at the White House from time to time, some opportunities that never would have been part of your life had you not been awarded that medal. Are there any in particular that... Um, you think that our audience might like to hear any favorite moments with the medal aside from the Super you know, Bowl, you know? And <laughs> yeah. The Super Bowl, you know, flipping a coin with Woody William. Yes. No, no big deal. Right before. <laughs> yeah. No, right in the middle of the field. No, that's, nah, that's just a little moment. No, I think, you know, I'm a big sports guy. First of all, it's the people that I've had to meet, uh, you know, between from our, our top, you know, scientists, educators, uh, politicians, uh, military leaders, athletes, you know, everybody, right? Movies, all that stuff. The people that you get to meet and be associated with and, and have a conversation with. Uh, it's a great, it's, it's super cool because it, it's, it was a quick reminder that we're all human beings. <laughs> and doesn't matter if you're making $100 million or if you're, uh, you know, a firefighter, you know, you know saving lives every other day in the end we all have feelings and we're all the same internally right we're just human beings and and we we want to be loved and we want to be respected the same way and so it's been a very big eye-opener in terms of who i am as an individual because of those experiences i've had you know meeting these folks in the military but on a selfish side i'm a massive chicago guy um, i'm a huge chicago bulls fan and then I, I just posted this on instagram the other day I had I had the opportunity to, you know, do an interview and, and be on the, on the floor of the Chicago Bulls. You know, and growing up, this is you know, the only thing I associated the United States with was, you know, the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan and the team. So that was a, a big moment for me. 
and, and then you know doing the same thing with the Chicago Bears, and that's given me an opportunity since then to work in the NFL on 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 a, on a on not not financially, but on a personal fun side, passion side, helping one of my closest friends, which is a head coach of New York Jets, on occasion during a season, talking to his team, talking to his coaches. Um, and so that's, these are massive opportunities that have been that materialized because of the metal, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. But I think what's important is what it's opened up in my professional life. You know. Okay, and I would tell our audience that getting, getting started this morning, Flo ducked out of meetings to come and join us. So that, that uh, sticking with it and commitment to work, thank you for taking a few minutes to be with us today. Um, I'm going to move over to some uh, education-related questions. We've had a number of, of questions from students and from teachers that have come in. Uh, what advice do you have specifically for students regarding ROTC or JROTC? Do you think that that's useful for students who are or perhaps are not going to think about going into the military? We know a very small percentage of our students actually will go into the military now, but is there still value in ROTC for them? Absolutely. I think, you know, anything that you do, there's a value behind it. Uh, whether it's JROTC, whether it's ROTC, whether it's joining a sporting team or chess club, right? It does, it's, you know, testing club. Everything that you do is an opportunity for you to learn something different, something that is going to allow you to be, to grow as an individual, it's going to allow you to, you know, take that information, do those experiences, put it in your kit bag, and and become a little bit better uh, for it. Uh, you're going to learn a lot in JRTC and, and, you know, about formations. You're going to learn a lot about, you know, being a team member. You're going to learn about character. Uh, you're going to learn a little bit about history. Uh, you're going to be challenged in ways you've never been challenged, right? But you're going to be just a little bit uh, uh, better behaved after it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's also it's going to allow you, I, in, in my personal opinion, you know, JROTC, even ROTC is going to give you some skill sets that are really going to be beneficial for you as you go on in terms of being organized, being punctual, um, uh, understanding the aspect of behind respect, right? Yes. And, you know, and and things, it's just really important um, key traits and, and that you need to, you know, we all need in our foundation to be the type of individuals that are going to be a positive influence in our environment uh, or in our community. So these are things that uh, you will learn, especially in JROTC early on, uh, that I probably could have used. I, I'll be honest with you. I could have used a little JROTC in, in my high school years. I was a little brat at times. I've done some dumb stuff in, in high school. I, 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 I had moments when you know, I was an athlete, right? And I, and I was a really good athlete. And I, I became popular. And I thought, the, you know, I owned the world at times by my junior and senior year, especially my senior year. And there's things that I did that, you know, I don't, I didn't, I'm, I don't appreciate today. Uh, but they're a part of my life and they made me grow up. Listen, I got corrected doing them, trust me, by my father, by my mother, by some teachers. Um, and, you know, and that's something that I'll, I'll never forget. Look, I'll tell you, I'll tell you very embarrassing one and this is something that to this day i feel really ashamed of and i was a junior in high school this is not a good story this is not a pretty story this is a true story though i was a junior in high school and i was in math class we had this kid that was 12 years old he was brilliant he was a genius right and he was out there and you know doing high school um uh math and and i uh I, you know my my friend and i we we're just messing with him and we took his homework and we erased it Right. Like we just, you know, we erased a little piece of it, not the whole thing. And as a joke and, you know, bull this is called bullying in essence. And, you know, we didn't see it as bullying, but we thought it was a joke. And he cried. Right. And I immediately was like, oh, look, dude, we're kidding. And so the teacher's like, what the hell just happened? You know, and I told him, I was like, uh, and he's crying. And at this point, he came out of him. I was like, we were playing a joke on him and we just erased his homework because he's so brilliant. And I guess we were a little jealous of him, too. But. You know, we want to bring and and that immediately that moment immediately changed me because I did I I realized I just whoop did something very stupid and I didn't mean it in that way, but it wasn't perceived the same way from the recipient, and so that was a sort of a sort a form of bullying, right? And I didn't hit him or push him. You know, we just took we erased literally four numbers on this thing, but to him that was his world, and we took that away from him, and so. um well, we had a nice talk with the teacher, and then uh, we took him under our we took him under our wing after that. And uh, I learned a big lesson then. It was a, I did something ugly, 
Um, and I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't like who I was because of it. And, um, I, you know, it's <laughs> to this day, I feel dirty because of it. Like I think about it, this was, I was 16, right? I'm 21 years ago. So, uh, but I'll never forget it. Yeah. I have to say though, that you're having just shared that with us, uh, for any students who are watching and for the teachers who might have an opportunity to share this story with a student at some later date, uh, your willingness to own up to it and to make it right. You know, it's real easy to say, oh, sorry, but to go back and make it right, to take him under your wing and to nurture him and help that 12 year old feel at home in a high school situation. I mean, that that counts for a lot. And I think that reflects on your character. And I appreciate you sharing the story, even though it was painful. Thank you for that. Yeah, it was it was um, ugly. No, I never appreciated myself for that. But um, I just, you know, he he's a good kid and he was brilliant. I mean, he's whatever he's doing now, he's probably, you know, I'm hoping that he's part of trying to figure a cure and, and, and a vaccine for this yeah, COVID-19. Do something so we can get out of the house again, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, you never know the the ultimate repercussions that your actions, good or bad, will have in the life of someone else and potentially in the world. So, yeah, I, let's hope he's doing that. Um, to go back to a, uh, your life now, someone asked a JROTC person who has not read the book uh, asked if you stayed on active duty. Why or why not? Um, like I said, I know the answer, but I, I think yeah. that it would be good if you would share that with us. So I did for a couple of years, you know, when I was in the hospital, and then I, and then I worked for the government uh, as a as a, a military officer. But then uh, because of my injuries, my path in the military ended. So after a couple of years after the injuries, I actually medically retired, and I went and transferred over to the government side as a civilian. And then related to that question, another another student asked, knowing the injuries that you live with, would you still have joined the military to serve your country? And why or why not? 100%. I would uh, do it all over again. I, even the pain and uh, all that stuff. I, I would obviously try to change a little thing in August 8th and, bring my, you know, and change the story a little bit uh, right. to have all my friends come home. But uh, yes, I every experience I've had has made me the person I am, good, bad, and ugly. Um, throughout my life and, and specifically in the military. Thank you for that. Um, once yeah, you can do that, Mark. What was that? I just, saw, I just saw a message from Mark about the book and getting it signed. Absolutely. We'll figure okay. a way out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. And I'm sorry, we have, a, we have 475 plus people attending this webinar in person today and it will be recorded so that people can watch it later, show their, their classes later. And I still have two pages of questions. So I'm, I'm serious about maybe us doing another one of these because I've still got the pages of character questions and pandemic questions and joining the service questions. So, but we're <laughs> down to just the last few minutes. So how about a leadership question? Is leadership yeah. inherent or can, do you work at it and learn it and develop it? It's kind of a nature They're versus nature. They're both. I mean, you have people who are just, you know, destined to be leaders, but it's it's a it's a, something that you need to work on and hone and learn from. And you're going to, you know, specifically as a leader on your mistakes that you're going to make, you need to you can take them personally. That's fine. Well, everything is taken personally, but you can't really, you know, get angry about it. You need to figure a way to learn from uh, the times when you get knocked down. You know, the biggest leadership lesson that I've ever learned in my life was to take my pride, my ego, and whatever my rank is, whether it's just, you know, in the government or in the military or, or as a civilian, and take that to the side and treat people as human beings and fully understand that, you know, if you care about people, then you will figure a way to be a better leader, you know, and then own your mistakes. And it's okay. It's okay to be vulnerable. 100% okay to be vulnerable. You got to own your mistakes. And lastly, this is leadership 101. This is for your younger folks here. As a leader, you're the captain of the ship. I don't watch Titanic, right? In a movie, the, the ship, the captain of the ship says, the ship goes down, the captain goes down with it. But when it comes down to highlighting successes, you highlight your team, never yourself, always, right? People are going to know what part you played and, you know, that you're the leader of this team. But that's not the whole point. As a leader, you need to go out there and make sure that you take care of the folks around you and below you. And I don't even like the word below, right? Because we're all teammates. So 
that's the one thing that you know leadership is always and there's always an opportunity of development always an opportunity of growth in it and there's there's going to be times where you're going to make mistakes and as a leader that's when you really earn your money um right now across the world this is for all these companies and these governments this is when leaders have to step up when they have to guide us teach us and remind us of how we're going to get through this what we stand for why it's important to follow the specific rules why it's important to work for us work together they need to be our example and that is what a leader does and i don't know when the leader gets mixed their money when they lead us through these incredibly tough situations for me it was over there in afghanistan uh and and you know when i in the middle of a firefight when i kept my composure and i trusted my team I didn't micromanage them. I knew what they were going to do, and they trusted me. And I trusted them. I did my part to lead the overall mission. They did their part to fight the enemy, and that's something that you know bonded that created this bond together and this unbreakable machine because we believed, loved each other, but we trusted each other, we respected each other, we listened to each other. And then when it came down to tough moments, and I had to make a decision, I made that decision, good or bad, right? You know, not bad decision, but I mean, whether or not it worked, right. I made a decision. And they trusted in me. And if it didn't work, we would figure it out together. And that's just the way, you know, and that's something that you learn through experience. Uh, that's something that you learn through a good support system. That's something that you learn through mentors, right? And that's something that, you know, you, you refine every step of the way consistently. And so there are natural born leaders, folks who are extrovert, you know, willing to go out there and put themselves. And there are people right. who are different types of leaders. And there are people who don't want to be leaders. And it doesn't mean that they want to be followers either. They just like to do their thing. And that's okay, right? And so that's that's the answer to that specific question. Well, Flo, thank you so much. That was That's a great way for us to wrap up for today. And there are a lot more questions still coming in. Everybody says hello and thank you for your service. And thank you for this, this service too, because this is continuing service to our educators, their students, and all our homeschoolers. So we'll turn it back to Ed Webb. And thanks to our supporters as well. Thank wow. you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talking to you, Flo. Thank you so much, Captain Groberg, for your service, but also for sharing this story, your insights, and your incredible attitude with us today. I see in the chat a lot of the teachers can't wait to share this with their students, you know, just to inspire them. And thank you, Kathy, also from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society for helping us make this possible. And of course, thanks for all of you who logged in today and who will share this with your students. And please join our free community on EdWeb. Uh, we'll post that link in the chat, but it's edweb.net forward slash CMOH. When you're a member, you'll be able to watch past interviews with recipients earn CE certificates, and be notified about upcoming interviews. And please visit the Medal of Honor Character Development Program online. There you can also access lesson plans, learn about other recipients, and a lot more. We will also post that link for you. And again, thank you, everyone. This was amazing. <laughs>